So next uh, speaker is uh, Anders Mintner, uh, who is uh, doing joint work with uh, many people about uh, confluence in lens synthesis. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, how we use confluence in our recent papers on lens synthesis. Uh, it's a bit of an applications paper, so I'm going to have to go into some uh, detail on kind of this wonky application of bidirectional programming before we kind of get into uh, the thickness of where confluence pops up. Um, please, uh, if you have any questions or if things get kind of too in the weeds, first of all, sorry. <laughs> uh, and then second of all, yeah, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask. I've got like five minutes of extra time, so yeah. Um, so first, what are lenses? Um, in this context, we're kind of thinking them of them as synchronizers. So really they're a bundle of functions, but these bundles of functions are used to synchronize files. So I could, in this case, or I could think about a lens that is synchronizing um, a piece of JSON data and some sort of specific text file in a bit of an ad hoc format. Um, so in this case, I'm going to have a specific um, JSON that has last name and first name. So Milton Andres is the last name and first name. I put this through one of the functions of my lens, the get function, and I'll get back uh, the pure text of Andres Milton. And looking at that, I can be like, oh no, that's that's not my name. Someone messed up again. I can update it to be Anders Miltner. And I can then use the lens to propagate that update back to the JSON uh, and fix the JSON file. So in this case, I'm keeping these two files synchronized using the lens functions. Um, there's a lot of lenses. There's a lot of variants of lenses. Um, I could have bijections, classical lenses, quotient lenses, yada, yada, yada. And there's also a lot of domains that lenses can be applied in. So they can be used for synchronizing strings like I'm doing right now. They can be used in relational algebras, parsing and pretty printing, data structures, and combinations of other domains. So you can have strings on the left, data structures on the right for parsing and pretty printing. Um, now, because they're just bundles of functions, one of the interesting things you can do for lenses is write a uh, domain specific language where you use one piece of syntax to express all of the uh, functions of the lens. And this is kind of the general area of bidirectional programming languages. Um, I'm going to focus on a very specific variant, uh, which is really restrictive of bijections and uh, the domain of strings. Uh, specifically, we're going to work in the language of Boomerang. So I'm going to very briefly go through a Boomerang lens so you can see what it looks like. Uh, boomerang lenses, you can use um, regular expressions to express the domain of lenses. So I could say, uh, so first I'm going to try to perform this transformation that takes uh, a series of first and middle names and a last name and turns it into last name, comma, series of first and middle names. I uh, can express what a name is, and it's just uppercase followed by lowercase. Um, a way of transforming, it's a kind of silly or a simple transformation, but it's used for bigger ones, is the identity lens. From left to right, it transforms Stephen to Stephen, and right to left, it transforms Stephen to Stephen. Um, now I can actually do a little bit of operations by using the swap operator. So now I have Stephen in a space, and that can go into space and then Stephen. Uh, and then I can iterate that Stephen space to space Stephen and vice versa um, using the iteration lens, which is a star. I can add a some kind of boilerplate like a comma by using the constant lens and then I can combine it by using the concatenation lens. And finally, I actually perform the swap of the last name using a swap lens again. Uh, so we've got a lens grammar um, consisting of the lenses that I mentioned already uh, in, and also using union, which performs uh, one lens or another, depending on what lens the string lies in. Uh, 
like does it lie in the domain or codomain of L1 or of L2? And there's composition that will bring it you from kind of through an intermediary format before hitting your final format. Um, but while there's a lot of research in lenses, they're not super used in practice. Uh, and that's partially because they're, they're not really that easy to program in, or maybe not insanely natural for a lot of people. Um, these combinators can be a little bit wonky and you can have to worry about these unambiguity constraints that I'm not really gonna focus on right now, but it's, they're just not widely used. So our, our thought are, is maybe if we could synthesize lenses, it would be a little bit easier and would get some more mainstream adoption. So what we do is we ask our programmers to provide two regular expressions describing their file formats, as well as a set of input output examples into our tool, Optician, and then Optician will create a lens uh, that then they can use. So in this diagram, we have that the user provides regular expressions. What we do is we use those to perform type directed synthesis to generate the lens. Um, so lenses have type judgments. Um, it has a number of uses. It specifies the languages that lenses map between. It guarantees that the get and put, which are the two uh, component functions that the lens comprises are well-defined and that they are inverses. And as I said, it's pretty useful for synthesis. It helps constrain the search space. So the typing judgment is L colon R left, right arrow S, where L is a lens term and R and S are types and our regular expressions. So we're using regular expressions as types. Um, so if we have derived that L colon R left, right arrow S, that means that there are two functions, the put and the get function, and that those functions are inverses. Okay, now I'm going to, there's three sorts of typing rules. There's syntax directed rules, composition and type equivalence. I'm going to talk about syntax directed rules specifically. Um, and I'm going to try to do that in the context of synthesis. So in, let's say I have a, I'm given a pair of regular expressions, r1.r2 and s1.s2. Now looking at this, I can use the concatenation lens uh, typing rule to theorize what I actually think my lens term should be. So if I theorize it should be a concatenation lens, um, I can simply break this down into sub problems of finding a lens between R1 and S1 and finding a lens between R2 and S2. And then once I've solved those and found those lens, I can just combine them with a concatenation lens. Um, similarly with iterate, if I see R star and S star, I can just break that into the sub problem of find a lens between R and S and then iterate that lens. Um, and then there's base case of the identity and of constants for if I have strings on each side. Now, if I just had syntax directed rules, synthesis would be quite easy. Um, but unfortunately there's, it's not just syntax directed rules. So composition, um, we immediately kind of hit a snag. So let's say I'm trying to find the lens between R and T. I theorize it should be composition. Um, one might say, oh, I just break it down into the sub problems of R and S, S and T, and I compose them. Uh, this obviously doesn't work because this S comes out of thin air. I just have to guess it. And um, there's, there's no way really of going from the bottom up easily. Um, and furthermore, in our language, composition is inadmissible. So we can't just say, ah, let's just not synthesize composition. So our solution is that we use an alternative language of DNF lenses. And these are nice because these don't use a composition operator. Uh, so let's go into the last one, type equivalence. Type equivalence is that if you have a lens uh, that is well typed between R and S, if R is equivalent to R prime and S is equivalent to S prime, we're using star semi-ring equivalence instead of general um, like expression equivalence, then you have a lens well typed between R prime and S prime. So this is useful because let's say we have a lens between um, R concat S or T and R dot S or R dot T. Um, if we look at the left side, we can theorize, hey, it's a concatenation lens, but you can't break the right side into a concat. Looking at the right side, break it into an or lens. You can't break the left side into an or, 
But what you can do is you can rewrite using type equivalence to a form where they're compatible with each other, and then you find the lens. So this necessitates a search through equivalent regular expression pairs. And that is a pretty huge search space, unfortunately, especially because type equivalence can be applied anywhere. So anytime in our search procedure, if we went off this, we could search for equivalent regular expression pairs. So one thing to tame this difficulty is that we use an alternative language of DNF regular expressions, which are a pseudo canonical form of disjunctions followed by concatenations followed by iterations. Um, so this thing in the left would not be in DNF form on the right, it would be. And DNF lenses are actually typed uh, between DNF regular expressions. So these two alterations work well together of DNF lenses and DNF regular expressions. And DNF regular expressions still have uh, some sort of type equivalence rule because they're only pseudo canonical. So you still can have to perform rewrites. So R star and epsilon or R star are both in um, DNF form, but if you unroll that R star, then they become compatible. Um, okay, now let's get into the weeds of things. So DNF lenses have kind of this, these two types of typing judgments. There's uh, the full DNF lens typing, and then there's also this rewriteless DNF lens typing or syntax directed DNF lens typing. Um, you can only swap from a syntax directed DNF lens typing to a DNF lens typing exactly once. There's only one rule that produces DNF lenses, and that's the syntax direct, or and that's turning from a rewrite list syntax directed DNF lens into the full one. And really, what it does is DNF or the syntax directed judgment builds up in a very, very syntax directed way, the DNF lens, and then um, the final rule performs all of the rewrites. Okay, uh, so this is also we, instead of just using arbitrary equivalents, we use directed rewrites. So we have a little bit narrower of a search space to go through. And because then we'll have some confluent stuff to prove later. Um, so our overall algorithm is that we have some regular expressions. Those go into DNF regular expressions. We do type directed synthesis to get a DNF lens that we then convert to a lens. Now, because our DNF lenses are so close to the algorithm where they have this specific search space for um, searching through equivalent regular expressions followed by a search space through the uh, syntax directed rules. So it's pretty easy to show these are complete. But if this search algorithm is complete, do we know that it is a complete procedure for bijective lenses? And we do due to a theorem of completeness. So for all lenses, L between R and S, uh, there is a DNF lens between R and S in DNF form, such that the semantics of L is equivalent to the semantics of the DNF lens. Okay. So let's go into actually how we do this. We do it by induction over the derivation of the lens. And we have to go through all the syntax directed rules, type equivalence and composition. The syntax directed rules are pretty easy. Composition is a little bit harder, but type equivalence has particular difficulty. So let's go into type equivalence. If I have a lens between R and S, R is equivalent to R prime and S is equivalent to S prime, then L has, a, we have a lens between R prime and S prime. So, Going through the induction assumption, we have a DNF lens, DL, and uh, regular expressions, DR and DS, where DR and DS are uh, R and S in DNF form, where, so this D lens right here has an, a corresponding DNF lens between DR1 and DR2 with equivalent semantics. So I'm going to be using this space for kind of drawing this up. We've got that. Then we can in apply inversion. So we know that there must exist a DR2, DS2, of which there's the DNF lens has a, uh, we have a syntax directed typing rule right here. So we've got DR1 writes to DR2, DS1 writes to DS2, and we've got the lens between them. Now we have, now let's go into kind of bringing it 
back to the final thing that we want to prove with this R prime and S prime. So we have that R is equivalent to R prime. So we've proven that that means that the reflexive, transitive, and symmetric closure of uh, R in DNF form is equivalent to the reflexive, transitive closure of R prime in DNF form. So there's this, um, we've got this DR1 goes to DR2, DS1 goes to DS2, and then we know that DR1 is related to DR prime using the reflexive, transitive, and symmetric closure of, uh, of our rewrites. Now we have to prove our rewrites are um, we that we satisfy the diamond property. And I'm going to go into the weeds of how we do that, but we do that, and then that guarantees the existence of this dr3 and ds3 that dr1 prime and dr2 prime go to. So now we've got now here's what we really want to find. We want to find a DNF lens somewhere here that dr1 prime rewrites to and ds1 prime rewrites to. And we want this lens between them to ha have equivalent semantics to L or DL. So I'm just showing what we're looking for. We're looking for this DNF lens right here. Now this looks a lot like confluence. I've got this DNF lens between dr2 and ds2. There's a rewrite to dr3 and we've got a rewrite to ds3. Can we go back in some way to make this DL2. So we're going to really focus on this thing right here. And because I've written like a lot of different uh, non-terminals with the DR1, DR2, DR3, let's abstract a little bit, let's pull it back up and talk just about something a little bit more fundamental. Let's say I've got this underlying set that has um, rewrites on it. I've got a binary relation on S1 and T1. S1 rewrites to S2, T1 rewrites to T2. Is it true that there is a series of rewrites? There exists an S2 and S3 that S2 rewrites to and T2 rewrites to that R holds it. And in this case, we choose R properly such that R, R is that R holds on two DNF reg expressions if there is a lens DL prime such that there's a syntax directed um, lens DL prime between uh, DR and DS. And that DL is specifically equivalent to this DL. OK, um, I already said this. It's just showing that this kind of diamond property exists, or this confluence-like property exists. We're calling this R confluence. Um, so it's just hard to kind of prove this directly. So we go through by showing a sufficient condition um, in this case, if our rewrites are confluent and R and the uh, transitive closure of our rewrites are bisimilar, then our rewrites are R confluent. Um, I'm just pulling up the definition of bisimilar here. The important thing is basically if you have a rewrite from series of rewrites from S to S prime, then there exists a T prime that T rewrites to and that R holds over. And vice versa also. If T rewrites to T prime, then we can have a series of rewrites on S and R will hold over it. Um, so our induction is over the length of this set of rewrites right here. So if the length is zero, then we just have T rewrites, and this is exactly kind of the right side of bisimilarity. In the inductive case, let's say we have S rewrites to S2, T1 rewrites to T2. By induction assumption, we have this R between S4 and T4. Now we need to get some sort of R right here. Well, first we use the fact that uh, our rewrites are confluence to guarantee an S5, and then we pull up this R using bisimilarity. So going back to our proof, we've got this type equivalence problem. We want to build up this DL2. Uh, we first say, that R holds on DR on some arbitrary DNF reg expressions if there is a lens DL prime such that that lens is well typed using only syntax directed rules and DL is equivalent to DL prime. Um, we've then proven our rewrites are confluent and our rewrites and the transitive closure are very similar and we're done.
So there's some related notions. Uh, in particular, confluence modulo equivalence is incredibly related because it's basically the exact same thing, except they require that R is um, an equivalence relation, whereas we do not, which does kind of mess with some of the proofs. Uh, but they're also pretty similar. So we have our sufficient conditions. Right here, I pulled from the Hewitt paper uh, some sound incomplete local conditions. This one is kind of confluence looking, it's local confluence. And then here's the other aspect of local confluence that you require. And honestly, as I was making this presentation, I realized, oh wait, I actually require too much. We don't need full bisimilarity. Uh, we can actually do the same kind of weakening they do, uh, where you can go from S to S prime, and then all you need is a series of the existence of an S prime prime and a T prime uh, that they both rewrite to and R holds over. Um, also, bisimilarity is it's common in state transition systems, and it's really related to commuting rewrites, um, which is common in the confluence literature. Um, the one reason we didn't really use commuting rewrites is because at least as far as I could tell, uh, that uses, that permits an arbitrary number of kind of rewrites with R where you can, it talks about a lot of the potential of the transit closure of R, whereas we're just carried about, we only care about this little diagram. So anyway, we can synthesize lens by synthesizing them in an alternative form. This form is equivalent, and the proof of doing this uses a confluence-like property, as well as confluence in other areas, uh, R confluence, and we proved some sufficient conditions to find R confluence. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Um, so are there questions or remarks about that? Oh, yeah, I have a question. Yes, please, Makoto, go ahead. Well, okay. Uh, thanks for interesting application of confluence to the lens problem. So I would like to ask you one point about the sufficiency proof. Uh, maybe the page 109. Oh my uh, gosh, you, I'm impressed you, that. Yeah. Yes, sorry, continue. Can you show the slides? So I haven't. Uh, Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, 109. There we go. And share screen. Boom. Hopefully this is visible. Oh, maybe yes. I can enter presentation mode. There we go. Yeah. Yes. And it seems that you forgot to assume the uh, termination of the rewrite relation. Yeah. So. You, you Use the induction on the lens. So uh, yeah, we're we're doing induction on specifically we're doing induction on the derivation of um, this. So you can actually keep going right here. Uh, it, it we don't have that um, that there's some sort of endpoint here. We we've got a kind of it's it's well founded, but it is yeah. not terminating. Um, yeah. So we're just doing induction over the derivation. Maybe there's a difference in definitions. Uh, yeah, but yeah, in, this, in general, so this kind of proof often appears in the rewriting. So it seems that uh, for, for the example, of the proof of Newman's lemma, mm -hmm. it also uses uh, this kind of proof method, assuming the. Uh, when foundedness of a rewrite relation because it yeah. used uh, when founded induction of the uh, rewrite. So this proof is also very similar. So, uh, so anyway, so by if you use by induction the length of the reduction, in general, I think that you need to assume the when foundedness of yeah. the okay. reduction. Yeah, for sure. And in general, so also, so anyway, so you use a specific uh, rewrite system on DMF, uh, DMF. Uh, so yeah, I don't and so, uh, and, and I related. Terminating? Sorry, is it terminating? So you are concrete rewrite system. Yeah, so um, it, it isn't terminating because it's it's very related to. Um, uh, 
Well, I can't find it. But basically, you, it, it, it doesn't terminate necessarily because you can, continue, you can continue unrolling um, kind of the stars an arbitrarily large number of times. So I can go from R star to epsilon or R star, R star to epsilon or R or R, R, R star, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, we should find it. So is it is it okay for you, Makoto, or do you have some more questions? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, sure. You can keep kind of doing this form of a of rewrite where I go from here to here. And then I could, for this inner R star, I could continue going up and have arbitrarily many uh, stars mm -hmm. continue. Yeah. So, so it isn't necessarily terminating. Oh, really? So, so you mean that uh, the your duration of the simple arrow is not terminating? Yes. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. I see. And so that's that's part of the reason why we do it with the diamond property um, in a number of locations instead of like local confluence. Um, is as far as I'm, I'm new to this literature, but I believe that uh, local confluence only really works in the case where you've got a terminating system. Mm -hmm. Then it seems that you have sufficiently proof doesn't work for <laughs> your uh, system. So maybe I advise- Yeah, we can talk about it offline, maybe. Yes, consider. Yeah. Okay, so okay, any, yes. any, any other question or comment? Um, no, if not, uh, then I propose that uh, we thank um, the speaker again.